Good morning and welcome to our service from Greenock Baptist Church this morning. This is a recorded service, but we are actually having services in the building now. We're actually having two services every Sunday morning, one at 9.45 and one at 11.15. And if you watch this service occasionally or regularly, but you don't go to any church, then we'd love to extend a welcome to you if you would like to come and be part of the, the worship service in the building one of these Sundays. Please let us know. It's important that we have an idea of numbers because of all the, the COVID uh, safety measures that we have to take. But it would be a joy to welcome you with us. And you can contact me about that at pastor at greenitbaptist.org and it would be great to see you on Sunday. But for today, let's begin our service by uh, reading a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And speaking of the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul says that all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. What a wonderful thought that is, that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. And the promises of God a theme that's going to be running through our service this morning, the very things that we need to hold on to uh, in difficult days like this. And our opening song talks of the, the wrestlings, the doubts, the failures that we can experience in our lives, but it likens God to a lighthouse. God is like our lighthouse, shining in the darkness, seeing us through. Here are some of the lines. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Enjoy this song. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace. In my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea
God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity of worship, a time to slow down, to pause, to turn aside and focus our attention upon you, our Creator God. You are the eternal God. We acknowledge that today. You are the creator of all things. And you know us, each and every one, individually, better than we know ourselves. You know, Lord, our fears, our concerns, our anxieties. And we come to you today, O God, and worship that we might know the peace that comes from being in your presence. I pray, Lord, for each and every person watching this service at home, perhaps some feeling very lonely and very isolated, not seeing anyone from week to week, finding it hard to be apart from friends and family, the normal social bonds that we cherish so much disrupted. Oh God, may you be close to them right now. Pray for those, Lord, who are struggling with poor health, with illness, with bereavement. Lord, you are the promise-making God. And all your promises are yes in Jesus. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of Christ, be with each and every person watching this service right now. Minister your grace and your love to them. And as we spend this time in worship, as we sing, as we hear the scriptures, Lord, may you renew within us a love and a faith for you. These things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to listen to another song just now sung by Robert and Claire, two members of our church family. It's an old song. Uh, leaning on the everlasting arms and well in days like this troubled days uh, days of anxiety uh, to know that there is a God that we can rely upon a God we can lean upon a God whose everlasting arms will hold us and carry us what a, a comforting thought and this is a song that you just can't help singing along to so enjoy as you probably will know, Claire and I like to kind of dip into our past. And here's another one from the past that I'm sure you'll enjoy and you'll remember. This just what it means as if we're leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, 
from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 through to 20. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thanks, Jean, for that reading. We're going to think about that passage in a moment. But before we do that, one more song. And there's a line in this song uh, that picks up in this idea, this theme of promise. It says, nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. So hold on to that. Sing along to the song and take that line with you as we come to think about that passage of scripture in a moment. Nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. Hey! 
you go about every day with a bunch of promises in your pocket or perhaps you keep them in your wallet or your purse. They see us through each day as we hand those promises over and we thankfully see them being honoured. I'm talking of course about £5 notes, £10 notes, perhaps if you're particularly wealthy you may have the odd £20 note as well. And I know we don't tend to carry a lot of cash on us nowadays, but if the notes are not in our pockets, well, they're sitting, hopefully, in our bank account. And if you have a look at one of those notes, it will say somewhere, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £5, £10, whatever it may be. It is essentially a promissory note. And the person who's making the promise is the governor of whichever bank has issued that note. And what that means is that the bank has pledged to the holder of that note that when you present it to them, they will give you money to the value of that note. It used to be a promise that the bank would uh, uh, give you the equivalent value of that note in gold, uh, whatever five pounds worth of gold was or £10 worth of gold is nowadays. That is not the case any longer, but that's how it used to be. And when you go into a shop and you hand over your banknote, the shop owner gives you goods to the value of that note. But the shop now has uh, that banknote. So they now have the promise of that money from the bank. And so a banknote is really just a, an IOU. But it is an IOU that comes with all the wealth and all the resources of a, a bank behind it. It's safe. It's secure. You can trust it. Unless, of course, the banks collapse as if that would happen. This morning, we're thinking of promises. Reliable promises. More specifically, the promises that God gives us in his word promises that are infinitely more sure and dependable and during the week as I lead up to these services I'm, I'm waiting on, on God looking to God to just direct me to a passage of scripture to speak from to, to have the right word from God to encourage us and to help us in these days and this, I believe, is God's word for us this morning. The certainty of his promises to us. To fill us with what that passage that Jean read to us from Hebrews chapter 6 describes as the full assurance of hope. Wouldn't you want that? To have the full assurance of hope. That comes from the promises of God. Let's look at this passage and the first thing to notice uh, as we come to it in the second half of Hebrews chapter 6 is just who it is being written to. We know that they are Christian believers, they are Jews or Hebrews, hence the title of the book. They are Hebrews who have come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. He is Jesus Christ the Saviour and the Lord, and they've come to believe in him, they've come to trust him, but there's a problem. In verse 12, the author uses a word to describe them. He doesn't want them to be sluggish. Sluggish. The NIV uh, version 
translates it as lazy. But I think sluggish captures the essence of that Greek word uh, far better. It's the idea of being slow, of being listless, of being drained of energy. Because these Christians that are being written to were facing a tough time. They were being harassed. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were in the process, many of them, of turning back, of giving up on Jesus. They were spiritually sluggish. It was all proving too much for them. They were discouraged. They were sapped of their spiritual energy. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that is a good word, sluggish, to describe how many of us feel this year. The stuffing has been knocked out of us. We feel lethargic and weary, and perhaps spiritually so. There has been a lack of Christian fellowship for those of us who are believers. Opportunities to meet together and be challenged and encouraged in our faith. That has, has gone over the last few months. Many of us have felt spiritually isolated. Reading the Bible and, and prayer have perhaps fallen down the priority list. Fear and uncertainty and questions have, have not our faith sluggish just about sums it up. And if that's the case, then the writer of Hebrews would want to say the same to you as he says to his original readers. Verse 11, we desire, he says, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Each one of you notice, no matter who you are, whatever age you are, whatever your circumstances, this is the pastoral heart of the writer. We desire for each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And we could all do with some of that, couldn't we? The full assurance of hope. Where do we find that? What can possibly give us full assurance of hope. How do we keep going until the end? Well, verse 12 provides the answer. Instead of being sluggish, we are encouraged to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We're back to promises. Promises made by God, that is. And the secret, says the writer, lies in following the example of those who've gone before us, who've shown great faith and patience in those promises of God. And in verse 13, until the end of the chapter, it goes on to explain what that means. And there are three things that I want you to notice from this passage this morning. Number one, the example of Abraham. Because you see, he is the prime example of somebody who has showed faith and patience in the promises of God. Number two, the trustworthiness of God. And the writer explains why we can put so much trust in the promises of God. And then thirdly, the assuredness of our hope. Where the promises of God are seen to be fulfilled and centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides us with a hope that is a sure and steadfast anchor for our souls. So let's look then, firstly, at the example of Abraham. We all love inspirational stories of great men and women of the past, and if you have followed the remembrance celebrations last week from the Festival of Remembrance, at the Albert Hall on Saturday night to the actual day of remembrance, just on Wednesday there. They were full of inspiring stories of servicemen and women who have demonstrated great courage and sacrifice and heroism in the service of their country. And we listen to those stories. And they do something to us and in us 
They move us, they stir us. Perhaps they inspire us to be bold and to be courageous in some area of our own lives. Powerful examples. And so it is in the life of faith, in the journey of walking with God. And Abraham is this well-known figure who is cited here in Hebrews chapter 6, who demonstrated great patience and great faith in the promises of God. God made a promise to Abraham, we're told in verse 13. And the specific promise is quoted in verse 14. Surely, says God, I will bless you and multiply you. And that quote, that promise comes from Genesis chapter 22 in verse 17, where God speaks to Abraham immediately after Abraham has been prepared to offer his son Isaac up to God in sacrifice. It's one of the most foundational stories of the Old Testament. God had called Abraham and God had promised to bless him with children, with many, many children. And that through his descendants, the whole world would come to know the blessing of God. But how could that be? Abraham was an old man. His wife was old as well. Such a thing was humanly impossible. But God had made a promise. And years passed and, and nothing happened. And then Isaac was born. It was, a, it was a start. But years later, God then commanded Abraham to offer up Isaac in sacrifice. It was all very confusing. Abraham's hope of descendants was being taken away from him. What was going on? And yet we read in Genesis 22 that Abraham obeyed God. And he prepared to offer up his only son, only to find God intervening to spare Isaac. And then... In Genesis chapter 22 comes the promise again to Abraham. The one that's quoted here in Hebrews chapter 6. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. The promise still stands, Abraham. And Abraham continues to believe. Or as verse 15 in Hebrews 6 puts it. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. What an example we're being given. This is the kind of person that you have to imitate, we're being told. That all through those barren years, all through those confusing times, all through the times when it, it seemed that Abraham had no idea what God was doing, he held on to the promise of God. And he obtained it. He received that promise. God's promise came good. The example of Abraham. But there's something else to give us encouragement here. Not only the example of Abraham and God's promises, but also the very nature of those promises themselves. Or rather the very nature of the one who gives the promise. And that is the trustworthiness of God. Because the promises that God makes are like no other promises on earth. Look at verse 13. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. And then on to verse 16. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all the disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Has anyone made a promise to you in the past week or so? Perhaps a tradesman saying that they'll be at your house on a certain day to do that important job. 
a colleague at work promising to pay you back that money that they owe you. A politician on television pledging some policy decision. Maybe your spouse assuring you that they'll get around to that job by the end of the week that you've been on at them about for months. Promises, promises. Who can we honestly rely on? And back in the ancient world of the Bible, they also knew the problem of just taking somebody's word for something. How could that be trusted? Often it was just words. And so to give a promise some weight, some seriousness, you would back the promise up with an oath where you would swear on something or someone far more important, far more significant than yourself. And that oath, according to verse 16, would be final for confirmation. But if we're talking about God, and if we're talking about the promises that he makes, then we have a problem. Because as verse 13 explains, there is no one and nothing greater than God that he can call on to swear an oath by. So what did God do when he gave Abraham this promise? The answer he swore by himself. There is no one greater. There is nothing higher. There is nothing more weightier. More substantial than God. He could only swear by himself. And in verse 14. We have that promise of God. I will surely bless you. And multiply you. But if you go back. To Genesis chapter 22. And the full quote in verses 16 and 17. This is what you'll read. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. God swore by himself. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. There is nothing higher, nothing greater, nothing more solemn than the Lord God himself. And so then, as verse 18 puts it in Hebrews 6, we have two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. And those unchangeable things are God's promise and God's oath. They are unchangeable. God does not say one thing one day and another thing the next day. He doesn't change his mind. They are unchangeable. And not only are they unchangeable, but when it comes to these two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, Hebrews 6 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. Not only does he not change his mind, but he cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Impossible. Notice that. There are some things that God just can't do. And lying is one of them. He cannot lie. It's not that God just doesn't lie. It's not that God chooses not to lie. He cannot lie. It is not part of his nature. It is impossible. The trustworthiness of God. God has made promises in his word that are absolutely secure. As we look out in this world, as we seek hope, as we seek something to depend on, someone to rely upon, God has made promises. Not only to Abraham, but to you through his word. And here are two good reasons not to be sluggish 
Imitate the faith of Abraham. Hold on to the promises of God when things are difficult, when days and years are, are, are barren and it seems that God is, is distant and, and then it seems as if God is doing something that we, we cannot understand what is going on. Imitate the faith of Abraham. Hold on to what God has said. And secondly, realize the trustworthiness of God when it comes to those promises. But there's one more thing, and that is the assuredness of our hope. Because these promises of God find their fulfillment and their center in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the verse at the beginning? All the promises of God are yes in Christ. And when we talk of how God has made promises to you, we're talking about the promises he has made to us in Jesus promise of forgiveness, the promise of life, the promise of hope in him. One of the most well-known verses of the Bible is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There's a promise. There is a promise for you that God has given his son, that whoever believes in him. Here's the promise that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God has made that promise and he is trustworthy to hold on to it and you can believe it. And the author of Hebrews moves on from the example of Abraham in the past to the needs of his readers in the present. He describes himself and he describes the people he's writing to in verse 18 as we who have fled for refuge. We who have fled for refuge. And they've fled for refuge. He's talking spiritually here because they've realized the spiritual danger that they are in. That without Jesus, without him as their saviour, then they, they, they lie under the wrath and the judgment of God and they fled to Jesus Christ for refuge, for safety, for shelter. He has become their hope. And it is the assuredness of this hope that he wants to encourage them with now. Let's pick up our reading at verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone on as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? How do we understand that? Simply this, that our hope is Jesus. And Jesus is pictured here as a high priest passing behind the curtain in the holy place of the temple into the holiest of holy places. And to these Jewish readers, they would have understood that perfectly, that there in the temple, the holy place, was a, a, a place at the very heart of the temple called the holy place. And the high priest would go in there. And the high priest would go through a curtain into the holy of holy places once a year. For that represented the very presence of God. And here Hebrews 6 says Jesus has gone there for us. He has gone there in front of us. He is our forerunner. He has paved the way for us to follow him. That because we are trusting in Christ that we too can come into the very presence of God. This is the hope that is set before us. That we are to hold fast to. It is absolutely sure. And absolutely certain. That because. We are trusting in Jesus Christ. We will one day certainly be with him. In the very presence of God. 
Verse 19, this hope is described as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Just imagine an anchor for a moment. Something solid and heavy embedding itself into the seabed. Preventing a boat from drifting away in the currents of the sea. Holding that boat firm and steady. That's the, the image that we're to have here of our hope that is in Christ. Our soul is to be moored to this immovable object, this sure and steadfast anchor. And that is what Christ offers the believer, a sure and a steadfast anchor. What an encouragement. These sluggish believers were being given. They were in danger of, of drifting away from their faith because of the persecu persecution and the opposition that they were facing. And the writer says to them, no, no, you have a hope that is sure and steadfast, a hope in Jesus Christ. Your souls are tethered to him. This is God's promise to them. An unchangeable promise. A promise that cannot lie. A promise that is guaranteed. I don't know how many promises you have in your pocket, your purse, your wallet, your bank account, those bank notes that promise to pay you money on demand. But I do know that those promises will only get you so far in life. This morning I want to point you to a greater set of promises. Promises of forgiveness, of hope, of life. All centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Given to, him, given to us by a God who does not change. A God who does not lie. Unbreakable promises that he calls us to hold faster. And so I say to you. Don't be sluggish. Instead, come and discover this full assurance of hope that is found in Jesus Christ that will hold you until the end when that day comes, either when we depart this life and go to be with Christ or he returns and takes us to be with himself. And we are with Christ in the very presence of our creator God. May God bless his word to you this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a promise making and a promise keeping God. Thank you for your promise to us that in Jesus Christ, your son given for us on the cross, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We come to you in faith this morning. We reach out to you and we lay hold on that faith and pray that we may be like Abraham of old who went through his long journey of life holding on with patience and with faith to what you had said to him. May that be true of us, that we might hope in Christ, that he may be the anchor for our souls, holding us fast in a tumultuous world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.